Okay, so the topic for tonight is the angel of the Lord. Who is he and should he be worshipped? Now, the most important divide between Judaism and Christianity has to be the deification of Jesus and the devotion and worship of him. For centuries upon dark centuries, Jewish people have chosen to die rather than to direct any devotion towards Jesus. Now, it's not because Jews love death. In fact, we know that the Jewish culture values life above everything. However, the Jew stands in a covenantal relationship with the creator of heaven and earth. And the loyalty and the devotion that the church was demanding for Jesus is seen by the Jew as the deepest violation of that covenant and that relationship. Now, it's not because we hate Jesus, but it's rather because we love God. And so, the devotion of our hearts belong to God and to God alone, no one else. And the essence of this relationship is God's love for us, His people, and our love and our devotion to Him as our God. And so, the focus of tonight's lecture over here is to discuss an argument that has been put forth by Christian missionaries to try and persuade Jews that worshipping Jesus is not a violation of our relationship with God. As I mentioned before, for most of our history, this has been a closed case. It was unthinkable for any Jew to ever consider violating this relationship with Hashem, with God. No matter what a Jewish person's uh, observance level in terms of keeping the Torah and the mitzvot, nevertheless, not a single Jew would ever consider violating this relationship with God by serving anyone but God. However, unfortunately, due to the sustained missionary crusade and a lack of proper Jewish education, both on an academic level and an emotional level, Many Jews, unfortunately, have been led astray by these misleading arguments, and this is what I want to address tonight. So let's get started. In order to justify the devotion and divine worship of Jesus, missionaries have combed through the Jewish scriptures and Jewish literature to try and find support for the doctrine of the Incarnation and the Trinity. Now, as they go through the scriptures, one of the discoveries that uh, they like to present um, as support for their worship of Jesus are a number of inst instances in the scriptures that have an angel of the Lord that appears to Abraham, to Jacob, to Moses, and to others throughout the scriptures. They argue, these missionaries argue, that these appearances are instances in the scripture in which we read about an incarnation of God. In other words, they see these passages as describing God himself appearing as an angel or as a man, and this, they believe, supports their belief in the doctrine of the incarnation. In fact, I've heard Christians say that any time you see the angel of the Lord in scripture, it's a reference to Jesus. Now, before we look at these passages about the angel of the Lord, it's important to point out that in all the stories of this angel of the Lord, this angel is never worshipped, and furthermore, there's never a commandment to either allow or to command us to direct any divine worship towards this angel. Now, another very important point uh, over here that I'd like to make is about the word angel itself. The English word angel is not a translation. The English word angel is an anglicized way of saying the Greek word angelos. It's a bit like Christ and Messiah. Messiah is not a translation. Messiah is just an anglicized way of saying Mashiach, right? which is the Hebrew equivalent to Christ in Greek, which means anointed. So here, angel is really an anglicized way of saying angelos, which is the same as the Hebrew word malach, 
which both in Hebrew and in Greek simply means messenger. That's what it means, a messenger or a representative. Now the fact that this messenger is charged with, with, a, mis, with, a, mis, with a mission by God, it's clear that this being is a being other than God who is here to do God's be- bidding and is subservient to God. Right? Obviously, if I'm sending a messenger to somebody else, this person may be representing me, but he's not me. And usually, if I'm sending someone else, that person is subservient to the one who's sending him on that mission. Keeping these two points in mind, let's take a closer look at the issue. There are passages in which in the scriptures, in which God seems to be interchangeable with an angel. For example, we read the story in Genesis chapter 18, where this is a time when Abraham is just after his circumcision, and we're told that God appears to him at uh, the trees of Mamre as he was sitting in the tent um, in the heat of the day. And so in verse 2 of Genesis chapter 18, we read that he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing by him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the ground. Verse 3, and said, my Lord, if I have now found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant. Verse 4 says, but please let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. So what do we have? We have verse 1 telling us that God appears to Abraham. And then we go on to read how there are three angels standing there. And so what's going on? If you read a little bit, uh, a little bit further um, in the story, we find out that two of these angels, two of these men, end up going off to Sodom to save Lot, the nephew of Abraham. And one, we don't know what happens to him. He seems, we, the, the scriptures don't tell us what happened to him. But what we do know is that in verse eight, in verse, um, in verse twenty-two, it says. Then the men turned away from there and went towards Sodom, but Abraham still stood before the Lord. And so the argument is, who's this third person? Is it God? Who's this third angel? Is it God? And so Christians will argue that this was an instance of God taking on human semblance, just like the angels in the story. Now, according to Jewish commentators, Rashbam and Ibn Ezra, they argue that the third man was actually an angel who was called by God's name. We know that angels have different names, and sometimes you have an angel who can be called by God's name, i.e. the angel of the Lord. It is this third angel whom Abraham was speaking to and addressing as Lord. So in the beginning, when he, when, when he speaks and says, Lord, he's referring to this angel who is called by God's name. That's one way of reading the story. I'll come back to this passage, but for now, let's deal with this idea of an angel bearing God's, uh, the name of God. It's very common <coughs> in the Jewish scriptures that when God wants to appear to prophets, he often sends an angel to represent him for the purpose of passing on his message to the prophet. Now, what we see in the scripture is that the angel, or better yet, I, I'd rather use the word messenger, This messenger speaks the word of God and the prophet will address God by speaking to this angel or speaking to this messenger. However, the angel or the messenger is not God. The reason why I stress the word messenger is because in the Jewish scriptures we find that God will communicate through human beings as well. As we find in the story of King David and the prophet Nathan, we find over there a story where King Nathan comes along with a message from God, and David seems to be making the confession to God, but he's speaking to Nathan, and Nathan gives him immediately the response from God. And so what we see over here is there's a human being that God is sending his message through, but this person's not God. In fact, in Haggai, Chapter 1, verse 13, we see that Haggai himself, who is one of the prophets, he's called Malach Hashem, and the angel of the Lord. Only here, if you look, the Bibles that you'll open will translate it as the messenger 
of the, the Lord's messenger. They don't translate it as the Lord's angel. They, let, they translate it as the Lord's messenger because that would be more of an accurate translation. But what we see over here is that Haggai, a human being, is called the messenger of God, and yet we know that Haggai wasn't God. But what about this angel of the Lord that we find in other places through scriptures? So, for example, in in uh, in number in in Genesis chapter in chapter in, in Genesis chapter twenty two, we find that there's an angel that calls out to Abraham. This is at the the, the climax of the story with Abraham taking Isaac up the mountain and he's about to slaughter him and by Yikrael of Malach Hashem the, Lord, the angel of the Lord calls, God, calls out from him and he says Abraham, Abraham and he says yes I'm here and he says don't touch, don't touch him don't kill him right and then what we read in verse 15 is that the angel of the Lord calls out to him again then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven and said by myself I have sworn says the Lord that because you did this thing and did not spare your son your only son I will surely bless you and I will greatly multiply your offspring like the stars of the heaven and like the sand that is upon the seashore and your offspring will inherit uh, the gates of their enemies all the nations of the earth Bless themselves by your offsprings because you have obeyed my voice. So here what we have is God through the angel telling Abraham that he's going to be blessed for obeying God's voice. But whose voice did Abraham actually hear? The angel. Because it's interchangeable. The angel speaks God's word and it's as if God himself is speaking. And when Abraham speaks back to the angel or whoever it is communicates back to the angel, it can be considered as if he was speaking to God. And this happens many times throughout scriptures. We find this, a, a similar story in, in, in Numbers chapter 22, where we have the story of Bilam. We know about Bilam, who was hired by Balak to come and to curse the Jewish people. And we know the whole story with the donkey, and the donkey all of a sudden sees the angel of the Lord standing in the way, and he says, what's going on? And then finally, when God opened up the eyes of Bilam to see that the angel of the Lord was standing there, Bilam wasn't sure what to do. Should I go back? What, what do you want me to do now? So he says, no, go. And only the words that I will tell you to speak, you shall speak. But what do we find in the next chapter? God puts the words into Bilam's mouth. So which one is it? The angel or God? So what we see over here is they're interchangeable. God often sends messengers, messages through messengers, but these are distinct beings and never are they one and the same as God, co-equal with God, or ever worshipped as God. So in short, God uses messengers, both human and angelic, through whom he brings his word to this physical world. But there is no indication that any worship is to be directed to these messengers. These messengers are clearly distinct from God and as such are not deserving of worship. So now let's go back to Genesis 18, for example, and the story of the three angels who appeared there. The truth is, that just like everything in Judaism and in Torah, there are different opinions about how to understand any particular passage. So when it comes to this passage, um, what we find is a widely held Jewish interpretation of this passage posits that there are four separate entities appearing to Abraham. God appears in verse 1 in a prophetic vision, and then three men. Because we know that throughout scriptures you find that visions of God are sometimes accompanied uh, by the sighting of angels. Um, and this is just another example. When we find this story with, with Gideon, it's the same idea that when God wanted to appear to him, there were angels that, 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 that appeared to Gideon as well. So according to this, it's possible to say that when the two angels left, right, that we read about in Genesis 18, and they go off to Sodom, it's possible that the, thir the third angel stayed behind while God spoke to Abraham. And there's nothing contextually um, wrong with reading it that way. However, as I mentioned before, some Jewish commentators say that, no, it's not four appearances, uh, it's not four, um, it's not God and three, but rather it's the angel of the Lord 
which was one of the angels, and he and Abraham addressed, addressed him as Lord because he was the angel bearing God's name. And so in light of all these texts and many more similar examples in Scripture, we can confidently say that the Jewish interpretation that it was the angel of the Lord that Abraham saw and not an incarnation of God is firmly rooted in the words of Scripture. The Christian interpretation that insists that it was God himself incarnate in man is without scriptural foundation, and in reality, there is absolutely no justification for directing divine worship to any created being, whether physical or spiritual, including Jesus.